The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Great. Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to have you joining us for this fire recovery discussion. Um, on the phone today, we've got Alan Savory, Michael Demick, and, and um, Aaron Lusich, um, all folks that, that are either touched pretty significantly by the, the recent fires in the Sonoma area or folks that can know considerably about fire recovery. Um, we will have a po portion of this conversation, um, and we do want your questions and feedback as we go through this. So if you could please, as questions come up, please write them in the um, oh, the, the question tab um, that you have with this. And then um, after we're done talking, we'll, we'll um, start asking those questions to Alan and, and uh, yeah, get some feedback. So, Really appreciate everybody's involvement, and uh, yeah, if we can, I'll introduce Michael um, Dimmick, who lives in Santa Rosa, California. Um, is pretty active in the space around um, regenerative agriculture, and, and goes back and forth to Sacramento trying to influence and change. Um, so that these sorts of, of instances of of the worst fire in history um, don't continue to happen year after year. Michael, nearly 200,000 acres have burned in this fire. 8,000 or over 8,000 homes were, were, or not homes, but structures were, were damaged. And then, you know, dozens and dozens of people lost their life. And that number could continue to, to climb. Um, what was it like to be in that situation as the Tubbs fire and, and this whole firestorm in this complex um, was just roaring around you? Uh, well, it was um, shocking, um, unusual, uh, frightening, at points terrifying. Um, it all began for me actually on Sunday uh, afternoon, evening, uh, about 9.30 p.m. A house two blocks from me, a block and a half from me lit up because the wind knocked down a power line, lit up uh, an empty field, and the house burned. But, you know, the fire trucks, three fire trucks came, then they left. And then at 12-12, my power went out and all my alarms went off in the house. I was about a mile and a half south of where the Tubbs fire came over the hill from Calistoga and right into North Santa Rosa. And so I woke up to that. And then uh, within 40 minutes, I started to hear the explosion of propane tanks and houses and cars in the hills and in the flats north of me. And I knew something very serious was going on. And uh, but it was so early and so that there was not much on the Internet. So I couldn't really I didn't know what was happening. And at 3 a.m., my sister called me and said, we're being evacuated. She lives uh, probably eight miles east of me up Highway 12 towards Sonoma Valley in the mountains there, the hills there. And she had to evacuate. And they came to my house about took them 45 minutes. There were so many cars trying to get out of the area. Um, and. Uh, by then, there was a lot of news on the internet, and I knew this was something very serious. My parents lived 16 miles north up in the hills above Healdsburg, and there were there was the, the Tubbs fire, which came over from Calistoga. Um, there was the Adobe fire uh, down south, and then there was uh, up in the hills um, north of us, another up north of Healdsburg, another fire. So they were all burning, and the phones weren't working in Healdsburg. Um, so my brother and I, at six in the morning, got up and drove on the back roads because Highway 101 was shut down because the fire had jumped the road and it was burning. You could see it from my house. You could see the, the light. The, um, and we drove as fast as we could on the back roads all the way to Healdsburg. And the entire way, it was just a mountain. It was like a mountain range of black smoke and an a, a orange glow in the hills. It was really wild. I mean, I, I was in a kind of state of shock. Um, so we came back and for, you know, the power was out at my house, the gas was off. So we had to end up um, staying at my godmother's uh, apple ranch in Grayton, which is, you know, uh, 12, 14 miles west uh, of Santa Rosa. And that's where my parents were camped for a week and my sister had, was out of her house for two weeks. So it was a shocking experience. It was living through a disaster. It was it was really amazing. And then uh, immediately I started getting emails and texts from friends who were losing their homes. So I know 40, over 40 families that have lost their homes. And um, I also heard some amazing stories about uh, properties that suffered less damage because of animals. And when, if you're interested, I can talk about those. But um, the beautiful thing that's come out of it is that people are awake 
to what you uh, you know what you intimated in your opening that this kind of thing is happening more and more frequently and there needs to be a new way of managing lands and um, hopefully this will spark I know the political leadership has been quite responsive to what's going on I think they're thinking deeply about how to approach it in the future and um, animals have to be part of that uh, management practice as well as the use of, uh, of um, burns controlled burns because properties that use controlled burns or had used controlled burns uh, I think did better and people that had animals uh, in some cases did better. Um, so it's it's a very interesting um, set of data points that we're going to get to review and hopefully change what's happening in, in how we manage our land, both at the state level and, and locally. All right. Yeah, thank you for that. It must have been terrifying to, to have to go through that. Um, and I'm glad to hear that the politicians are starting to be a little bit more receptive to to dealing with um, you know, land management broad acre in a in a way that's proactive and is going to build resiliency into um, our communities and into our landscapes. Um, I did read that Jerry Brown said that this was a horror that no one could have ever imagined. Um, seems like that is a little bit um, like having the blinders on. I mean, year after year, the Western states, either California, Nevada, Oregon, this year Montana you know, every year it's the worst fire year on history, it seems like. Um, you know, it's time for, for these folks to, to really get proactive. Um, finally, it looks like um, the Department of the Interior is starting to look at outcome-based grazing um, on BLM ground as the way to, to manage these allotments. So that is definitely some, some forward progress. And hopefully they citizens in all these communities across all of our states will start to stand up and, and decry that, that their tax dollars shouldn't be used to clean up messes, but rather um, we should be proactive and, and build communities and build infrastructure and build um, economies around agriculture that will build resiliency and, and structure into you know the water cycle and ecosystem process. So yeah, I thank I, you very I, much and I thank you for the work that you do. Um, with with your organization could you tell us a little bit about that yeah i, I uh, um well we uh our job is to work with groups up up and down the state to put pressure on legislators to think more proactively about agriculture and food systems and sustainability uh we we um are really trying to wake the legislature up to the fact that we underinvest in the food and agricultural system in california um you, you know, in, in relationship to how important it is to the future of the state and the economy of the state. So uh, it's not a priority. There are, you know, they're, they're focused on other things. And I think that this, this event, um, and as you said, uh, the fires that have been going on for years, um, Southern California has been burning for 10 years uh, out, out, outrageously. And so, you know, now it's begin it's moving north as the state gets drier and, uh, and warmer. And so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the networks that we work with um, can be very could be very important in helping the legislators to to unleash the money because this fire is going to cost five to ten billion dollars just for Sonoma County recovery. And if it would not have cost us, the last time this happened was 1964. A big fire came over from Calistoga and and, and hit Santa Rosa. So we could we would have not we we could have avoided um, if we would have managed the the fuel loads, it would not have been so dramatic, and we would have saved money by all these years managing the uh, the ground properly, burying wires instead of uh, having them elevated. Um, it would not have cost us five to ten billion dollars over the last fifty four years. So um, I think it's really important for us to think in longer time frames uh, about how we manage lands, and I think that that's a struggle to get legislators to think on the long term, and it's going to take the public, and that's what our job is to get the public stating what they want from legislators. And so I, I can tell you that um, I'll certainly be committed to working with partners on that. Well, thank you so much for that, because that's the, the conversation that needs to be had. And, and I totally agree with you. Um, not only would it not have cost five to, you know, to six to $10 billion to, to be proactive in this, it would have been a net revenue and a, and a tax generator for all these communities in the Western states as producers would have been, um, you know, increasing production and, and the tax base for these communities. 
and we would have found a lot more resiliency in drought situations by an improved water cycle. Mm-hmm. I really, yeah. really appreciate your involvement and, and you coming on this, this conversation with us. I think it's probably this, this is a, a perfect segue to bring Alan in um, because he has, um, for those that haven't met Alan yet that are on the line, Alan has developed holistic management over the last several decades and is the leader in regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing system um, through holistic management and holistic decision making. Has seen um, dramatic recoveries in desertification and after fires, after floods, after all sorts of calamities, um, utilizing livestock as a tool. So, um, Alan, how are you doing this morning? Uh, it's not morning, it's evening for me. <laughs> but, oh, that's uh, right, that's but, right. Uh, thank you for having me on this. With it. I, I listened to Michael with great interest. The uh, It's hard to come in and comment on something like this when so many people have had such tremendous losses, including so many lives, and it's always humbling to try and talk about that at all and appear wise after the event uh, or anything like that. But it is appropriate to have the discussion because so much more could be done, I believe, and as Michael said and you've said, um, to avoid um, increasing catastrophes because if we continue as we are, we are going to see ever-mounting catastrophes and I'm not indulging in hindsight there. I've been saying this uh, in the United States for a great many years, that it's like one tsunami after another hitting us. And none of this is being caused by nature. It is all being caused by us. And unless we change what we're doing, it's um, you don't have to be very wise to say that it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, so it's very timely to start seriously talking about longer time frame and better policies uh, to begin to deal with not just the mega fires that are developing, but the increasing frequency of floods, increasing frequency of uh, droughts, and so on. Now, when um, talking about fire, on the land, as you did, Spence, with the holistic planned grazing process that that we use, there are really um, a few features there that would help people a great deal. One is the long-term one, and it was mentioned, of reducing fuel loads, uh, preventing the buildup of, of really inflammable oxidizing material, and I've seen a lot of that happened in California, and when I tried to draw attention to it, I raised the anger of a number of environmentalists. But we do need to deal with that, and it does help us to. And the other thing it does in terms of recovering is the, the belief um, throughout the United States and the teachings, as I found when I went there, was that if you have a fire accidental or you do a burn deliberately, you should keep animals off that land, uh, usually they said for up to two years. Now, it's exactly the opposite if we heed the science and not the beliefs. And one of the beauties with holistic plan grazing, when we do have a fire, and it's very timely, we've just had thousands of acres burnt out here in, in Zimbabwe, um, it's it's very important to get the animals back on that land just as fast as you can uh, after the burn. And so we do that in the planning process. We absolutely do not let rest the land uh, for two years, uh, which is a detrimental thing to do uh, in these environments. But the, the greater thing it, it does, uh, or one of the great things it does, is when uh, farmers have been burnt out. It's not going to help the city folks, obviously, but when farmers have been burnt out um, or had major part of their property burnt out, 
the planning process itself just gives such incredible peace of mind um, and ability to work out the best possible plan in the catastrophe that you're facing. And it, it may be appropriate just now to, to tell a story of one rancher and, and how that actually helped him and saved thousands of dollars but in just an hour of planning. So anyway, those are the main features. But the one I'd like to, to most talk about, and it, was, um, it came up with you and Michael talking, is this need for a longer time frame, more clear thinking. And I'd like to go just to very, very basic common sense, uh, which most people have. Uh, if we look at desertification of California, uh, which is so very severe, particularly in the South, um, and we, if we look at uh, climate change, the things that are blamed most by our universities, our government agencies, our environmental organizations, by society uh, as a whole, the things most blamed are livestock and coal and oil. But if we use common sense, we can quickly see that livestock and coal and oil are resources. And no resource can cause your problems. And as nature is not causing our problems, what does it leave us? And it right. only leaves us thing. We are causing it with our management. Then you begin to look into what is it in our management that is causing this. And it's, it's not just the catastrophe of fires. If you look at the drug policy of the United States, it's increased drug use and spread violence across borders. If you look at the policy on terrorism, it is spreading terror, costing enormous amounts, disrupting economies, etc. If you look at something as simple as the policy, the war on weeds in the United States, I'm told it costs a billion dollars a year and it's never killed a single weed in a single state, and we just keep doing it while it's poisoning our rivers and bankrupting farmers, etc. So th there are many things that we will begin to put right as soon as um, the public begins to insist that we look at the management and stop blaming our resources or anything else. And I think that we'll begin to put these things right and come up with more sensible policies very quickly. And why I say that is because there's such an immense amount of knowledge, so many capable, competent people in California, the United States generally, there's such a wealth of knowledge in our, on our farms and our ranches, our businesses, our universities, our environmental organizations, and most people are good most people are trying to do the right thing. So if you address the cause of the problem, I think you can put it right quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're 100% right. And I, I do believe that there's so much more awareness now. Um, and then, you know, case studies and things that we see on the ground. Um, the picture that I've got up on the screen now, I hope you can see it, Alan, um, is off the Pepplewood Preserve. You can't? I can see it. Okay, good. So this was on Aaron's property and him, the Pepperwood Preserve burned. Um, however, he had been um, managing his grazing and planning his grazing for the last several years and, and conditioning the landscape um, in such a way that, that he was building some resilience into it. Um, with that, following the burn, um, he said the, the, uh, he um, allowed his livestock to go out back into this foreground where it's green and recovering. Behind, we can see in the, in the background of this picture, an explosion, and that's been a long-term explosion um, where the livestock has not been allowed to go for years and years, um, Aaron, Aaron shared with me. Um, and you can see the difference in the um, severity of the fire just at that fence line, and you can also see the um, recovery that has happened since um, not only was there armor on the soil in the foreground, but after it burned, the livestock were immediately allowed to go back into that site because it was right near where he was uh, feeding his, his supplemental feed to his livestock to keep them going. Can you ex 
explain some of the things that um, livestock can do following a fire in terms of ecosystem processes and and you know the animal impact causing germination sites and, and just increasing the the speed in which recovery can take place um, that we can see in this this photo here. Spencer, can you lean back? You you're leaning forward and it's just booming and then I can't hear for me with oh, my I'm sorry. hearing problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alan. Um, yeah, Alan. so in this picture, the foreground um, had litter and armor on the soil. Um, and then following the fire, livestock were allowed to go back into that site. In the background, there was a long-term livestock exclosure that they were using to study the tool of rest at the Pepperwood Preserve. And you can see the um, dramatic effects of the severity of the burn where livestock had been omitted for the last number of years and the, the how much slower the recovery process is back there. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if you could share with us some of your um, understanding as far as how livestock can speed up the recovery after a fire and what are they doing to encourage healthy ecosystem function and ecosystem process? Yeah, the, the way they do, you know, you've got different environments, as you know, on the scale of what we brittleness, where where the um, environment is humid most of the year. I use that term brittle because if you pick up dead twigs, dead leaves, uh, they just crumple softly in your hand without any sound. If you go across the scale of brittleness and you pick up dry leaves or twigs and crumple them in your hand, they crackle and snap and they, they're very brittle. So all environments fall on that scale somewhere. Now, as you get to the lower end of that scale, which you tend to find on parts of the east and west coasts of America, over much of Europe, et cetera, where there's humidity through most of the year, all right, the, the tools available to humans for recovery after a fire or any catastrophe that exposes a lot of soil, any catastrophe that does that, the tools available to humans are very limited. Humans think we have thousands of tools, but we don't if you put them into categories. We have technology, we have fire, and for 99% of human existence, we only had two tools, technology and fire. Now, if something bears the ground, you don't even need to use technology in the perennially humid environments. The, the plants reinvade and cover that surface so quickly that you do nothing but use the rest or resting the land to let it recover. Now, as you get across that scale of brittleness, as you do in much of California, etc., to where it gets brittle and plants oxidize in sunlight, uh, if there aren't a lot of animals on the land, you build up a great amount of inflammable material. Now, if you get a fire or anything that exposes thousands of acres of bare ground there, if you think about the tools we have, um, technology, rest, or fire, or using technology to plant trees or grasses, but it's still a use of technology. If you think about those, um, none of them really help much. Technology is extremely expensive. It is, is not needed um, because you can do the same thing with animals. Uh, fire is not going to help it, but fire is usually going to expose the soil. Resting the land um, leads to uh, deterioration. Uh, so uh, technology plus planting grasses, which is what America does a lot after a fire, is a total waste of money. It's not needed. So if you think about those tools, you can see why we get frustrated. We don't know what to do. And we think, well, we're going to do the best we can. And so usually we end up using technology to plant grass or plant trees or try to plant something on that ground. Now, when you start to manage holistically and open your mind and no longer vilify livestock and accept 
that these climates like that, those environments, the plants, the soil, the soil life, all life co-evolved with millions and millions of large herding animals way before modern humans. If you open your mind to using animals, then you have another powerful tool. And that's why for, for the last 50 years, when we've been managing holistically, if we get a fire, we get the animals onto that land just as fast as we can and bunched crowding and moving across it. And we don't fear uh, overgrazing plants or anything because of the planning process. Mm -hmm. So you, you're really just putting another tool in the toolbox that fits in with what nature would have done, what nature does, what we observe in Africa. Uh, here, if we get a big fire, some of the animals will be on that ground when the uh, smoke is not, it, it's still smoking from dead burning trees that are still burning. And we'll find animals getting onto that ground. So it just brings in another uh, possibility for us and a powerful one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, litter that was laid down. Um, the, the green litter is a picture that I took off, off our ranch, um, but the litter on the left, the scorched litter, that is a picture that, that Aaron Lusage from Sonoma County sent me, um, what the fire looked like behind his, his livestock. Um, and you can see that the fire, you know, burned, I, I don't know, I think it burned 4,000 acres of, of Aaron's grazing land and, and definitely set him way back. But the effects of the fire on his ground, um, you know, just scorched the top of that armor, or, you know, litter is, as we call it in holistic management, Gabe Brown from North Dakota, he likes to call it armor on the soil. Um, but we can really see how planned grazing and how the effects of livestock um, on the landscape in grasslands can promote resiliency from you know some of the most intense fires that California has seen in you know literally decades, maybe a century. Um, and with that, it's you know pretty evident that Aaron's recovery is happening you know quite quickly, you know, specifically on the ground in the, the slide that I showed before, where the livestock had been able to come. Um, immediately. I just wonder what it would have looked like if 200,000 acres in Sonoma County had had that type of management on it. Um, you know, I, I think that the fire would have been much easier to control, much slower moving, and, you know, we could have prevent, prevented a lot of loss of life and, and treasure um, for our, all these communities. Um, the importance of litter on the ground, you know, in all environments, brittle and non-brittle, um, is, is dramatic, specifically to ecosystem function and ecosystem process. And as holistic managers, we are constantly monitoring that litter and, and looking for, for whether it's decomposing or composting litter or just kind of that armor on the soil. With the dramatic fires that California has seen, how would you perceive, knowing that, that most of those acres are burned super hot and intense amounts of bare ground, what is that going to do to the water cycle, to the mineral cycle, community dynamics, and, and energy flow on those landscapes? Um, and how will these folks begin to recover from that? I'm, I'm foreseeing drastic landslides when the rains come here in another month or two. Um, closed roads, infrastructure projects. Michael um, inferred to the five to ten billion dollars worth of recovery just in Sonoma County. Um, that's only the money that needs to be spent for the disaster behind us. Um, all the mudslides and landslides and, and road work will have to be done in front of us as well as the, the water cycle issues need to be dealt with. Are you asking me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, you, you, refer, you refer to the water cycle and the other processes. A lot of people um, don't know what those are. But the, the, just if you look at the one ecosystem process, water cycle, it's terribly critical to overcome the 
ignorance in California about this because of your increasing frequency of floods, mudslides, droughts. All of these are symptoms of a non-effective water cycle. And Jody and I go over to California periodically and, and uh, see what's there. And uh, it, it always shocks me to see how much ignorance there is. And maybe this will be a wake-up call for people to start learning about how that works. Now, it all begins to go wrong when soil is bare and exposed. That's when it begins to go wrong. If the soil is covered through management, things tend to come right. And you're very aware of that and you're making that point. Now, when you look at thousands and thousands of acres of land anywhere in the world, not just California, when you look at thousands and thousands of acres, if you find a high percentage of bare soil between the plants, right, as you do over much of California, almost all of Nevada, much of Colorado, almost all of New Mexico, Arizona, etc. Okay, that, that is serious. That is desertifying land when you have that. Now, we're fortunate because globally, worldwide, any environment, I cannot find anything other than two things that cause millions of acres to ex exhibit a high amount of bare ground between the plants. We're looking at it right here in Kenya now. We have it in Zimbabwe. It worldwide this is so. The two things that lead to a high percentage of bare soil between plants are one, fire uh, in, in management or accidentally. And the only other thing I've ever found that causes it is too few large grazing animals on the land, overresting the land while they're overgrazing plants. And I've never been able to find any other thing that causes it. Droughts don't cause it. Nothing else causes it. So you do look at much of California, much of the Western United States, and you can stop at random almost anywhere. And from 50 to 90% of the ground will be bare between the plants. Mm -hmm. So the political, the uh, economic, the social, in every way, climate change, everything, significance of what I've just said is just mind boggling. And it may take something like fires in California to wake the public up to start questioning this tremendous ignorance in the country about <laughs> how water cycles function. Yeah, I think you're you're 100 percent right. And I've heard you speak um, numerous times over the years about the wicked problem of government lagging in leadership um, and how they're they really cannot do anything until, you know, the, the paradigm in the, the public sphere has changed and they demand it. Um, how much more of this do you think? that we are going to take before um, communities and populations in California start to demand better from management um, of our society, of our communities, how we treat each other and, and our landscape. Um, what's it going to take before Californians and, and people in the Western U.S. Um, start to embrace a holistic management perspective um, in their government, because it truly it is up to us, and, and you know, thank goodness Michael's at the forefront of that, working in Sacramento and, and lobbying for a, a more holistic management in government. But kindly, I don't well, feel like we can afford too much more of this nonsense. Uh, and so, if I could say something, you know, we've got to stop blaming, and. Um, it, with all due respect, I'm hearing you blame government, but it's not just mm -hmm. government, it's all institutions, <coughs> environmental organizations that have opposed what we're saying for 50 years and, and mm -hmm. vigorously, cattlemen's organizations. I don't know a single cattlemen's organization in America that supports what we're saying. 
So it's not That's just right. government, all institutions, and nobody's being bad. Uh, it took me a long time to understand what is going on, but Thomas Kuhn described it in the structure of scientific revolutions. Uh, Eric Ashby described it in his work, and I often refer to this on Facebook and so on, um, that when you've got counterintuitive new knowledge emerging, all right, our institutions reflect public opinion. And mm -hmm. if you go into any of our institutions, I guarantee that you'll find them using pretty well the latest technology, the latest software, the latest computers, the latest of everything in technology. The reason for that is because society believes in technology. Now, mm -hmm. if people say plant trees to deal with climate change, we give Nobel Prizes for it. All right, because people believe in it. Now, if you say, hang on, the only thing that can actually stop this enormous amount of bare ground and desertification and megafires building up, etc., is livestock, society doesn't believe in livestock. So all of our institutions, including cattlemen's organizations, oppose the change. And they lead the opposition and ridicule to change. And, and it's not that they're bad. It's how complex, soft systems function. It's never changed since Galileo. So what, what can change it, and the only thing as far as we know that can change it, is people talking to people, using the internet, social networking, just people talking, talking, talking to each other. All of those people who've experienced such tragedy with their homes uh, burnt and family members lost, they need now to start talking about solutions. And the only way you're going to have solutions, going back to what I said earlier, is to change the management. Mm -hmm. So anything else you say uh, is like rearrange the deck chairs on the, on the Titanic. Unless we change management, it's, things are not going to change. Not significantly. That's right. Uh, when the management yeah. changes, includes policy, and then you will, and, and I think Michael mentioned it earlier, you won't have stupid power lines that can blow down in winds. You'll start burying these. These are all matters of, of policy and so on. Uh, you, right. you will have more sensible policy throughout <laughs> California, in the frequency of droughts, reducing the mudslides, reducing the flooding, improving the water cycle reducing the danger of extreme fires all that can be done frankly relatively easily it's not a technical problem it's a people problem mm -hmm. no i i'm glad that you said that and made that clarification because that is uh certainly the point that i was i was hoping we could we could clarify and make um i really I'm excited about all the work that's happening um, all over the world. I know that you're in Kenya now with um, all the or a lot of the the hub leaders from the Savory Network and and all the good work that the Savory Network does, helping um, farmers and ranchers and, and institutions and and land managers of all kinds develop a holistic approach and develop the management that will build resiliency into their land bases and into their businesses um, and how that trickles into economy and community um, is super exciting for me and I'm, I'm so pleased that, that that's out there and available. Um, I'm also super excited to share with the folks on the on the call the Savory Institute was awarded a grant from a granting institution in the Bay Area um, that, that, that will allow us to <laughs> um, that will allow us to um, support and educate and train farmers and ranchers um, in holistic management um, free of charge. So if any of you are interested in California to apply to that grant, please contact me um, and we can set you on that path to, to um, get some of that education to, to start to build more resiliency into your land bases. Alan, thank you so much for um, joining us, I think we will um, pivot a little bit and we'll bring Aaron Lusich into the conversation. Um, Aaron is a farmer, um, rancher, grazer in 
Sonoma County and a lot of these pictures that we showed today um, come from his um, his ranch or the the ranch that he grazes the Pepplewood Preserve in in Sonoma County. Um, Aaron, how are you? I'm great there, guys. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, how was you know what did it feel like when this was all happening? What was going through your mind when you know the the news coverage, you know the Tubbs fire, you know the fires all around your area were kind of you know bearing in on your livelihood on the on the places that you love and the livestock that that are so dear to you you know kind of what was going through you at that point um well you know the funny thing was i i didn't <clears throat> i didn't really have that outside perspective i i was off site <laughs> on sunday night when the fire started um and the next day i uh, I was in Valley Ford at a, at a partner's ranch, Truegrass Farms, and uh, the next day I loaded a quad. Actually, I thought I was going to spend half a day here and then go up and deal with things. <laughs> That's how naive I was. I hadn't seen any news coverage, um, and then I I started it started to sink in a little bit down here. So we we loaded a quad um, ATV on a trailer, and uh, I hustled up and I thought I'd just go north, come in. Uh, the roads were closed. Uh, it was pretty buttoned up, so I kind of snuck in through a ranch on the west side and hit the fire line at about three, about three, three thirty. And from that point on, I was just in triage. Um, uh, what was strange is we're on, you know, I'm on a total land base of about four thousand acres, and it was. It was, wasn't until Thursday, the fire started on Sunday night. It wasn't until Thursday that I saw a red truck or a yellow suit uh, because, because they were prioritizing the structures that were burning down in Santa Rosa as, as they should. Um, but it's a very surreal thing to be on land that you've managed. Uh, we've been there for five years and, and just watch it burn around you with, with nothing, uh, w without very little ability to do much about it. Um, right. and it wasn't until I got about three days in, I, I went to a neighbor who's, who'd saved his house and, and saw the news. And I, that's when I went, Oh, this is kind of a big deal. It sounds like this is a big fire. <laughs> yeah. 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 How, how did the land, um, that you managed and and the holistically managed ground ground around that area fair compared to um land in the area that was rested or absence of livestock or or that type of management um was there a observable difference um between the severity of the fire and intensity um and then recovery afterwards yeah there's there's in that area there's three primarily well let's let's say four primary kind of ecotones so we've got um pasture where you know at, at pepperwood we're a mix of pasture and woodland and uh chaparral um and vineyards uh so uh and the conventional grazers or the 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 more hobby grazers around me uh who kind of feed all year they were they didn't burn because there, there was nothing to burn so those fence lines that have circulated uh, social media that i show uh, on two sides now instead of having grass or litter on one side and, and almost bare soil or fillery on the other now it's they're tan and i'm black <laughs> so it's flat mm -hmm. uh, the the main the main the the vineyards didn't burn um the chaparral uh and the closed woods is it, it, and those two are i think fairly similar from some kind of a fire standpoint uh the fuel load's different in the forest but it's it's this uh it's this acceptance of of like the chaparral condition as natural 
um, mm -hmm. and and talking talking to countless firefighters, that's the atomic bomb when the fire comes through. Uh, where we had grazed, uh, or where neighbors had had pruned their trees up high, my cattle eat the oaks up to where they can reach. And in a lot of those situations, um, you can see grass or, or uh, litter under the tree. So the fire burned up to the drip line and went around the tree in a lot of instances. Um, there were a lot of people on, online on chat groups and, and keeping, uh, having Facebook through this was, was very helpful to have this kind of support system. But uh, people were talking about, well, you should, you should, I read a book and you should graze fire breaks early in the season. I was like, you know, no, this is a fire that jumped over Highway 101 and burned the, the Kmart down. Um, there's no fire break. There's no planning for the, the fire that we just had. Um, but having a resilient system in the line of that fire is better than any other option. And, and as far as I'm concerned, um, thinning our woods, moving to more of a savanna ecosystem is going to be the most resilient thing that I can see from my point of view, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a savanna for that part of the world is um, historically the, the um, most um, applicable um, type of, of landscape. And in order to maintain a savanna, you have to have large grazing animals in a in a brittle um, tending area like where you live. Without that, you're going to successionally drop, and and that's where the coyote brush and the manzanita and and these other types of super flammable greasewoods will come in. Um, and you know, just like you say, it's a it's an atomic bomb rather than a slow moving fire across litter that can easily be put out. Um, you know, the, the BTUs coming out of that is just horrendous. So, um, yeah, if we can transition more of those acres back into a healthy savanna um, and graze those acres, we can build not just resilience to fire, but also to drought and to flood, um, to landslide, to, you know, the mineral cycle will improve our food and fiber coming out those landscapes will be of higher quality um, and with that there will be more money circulating around these communities increasing the tax base and you know there's, there really is no downside to good management not in any you know it's better for the wildlife it's, it's better habitat building we can um, manage for and plan for um, our conservation values that we have on our landscape and and you know we can coexist and flourish with livestock production and you know wildlife and creating all of these other um, benefits that we like um, including good wine since you since you mentioned vineyard production um, um, how are you feeling about everything now? The dust is kind of settled. You guys had a half inch of rain here a couple of weeks ago, and you're starting to see um, some green sprouts come up. How are you feeling now? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm I, I'm optimistic. I'm generally an optimistic person. Uh, um, not to minimize how kind of devastating this is. It's it's a month now actually and uh mm -hmm. and it it's it that's surreal in it in itself because it feels like it happened yesterday um in fact i'm sitting in the room that i was in the morning uh that i decided to get on the truck and and hustle up there and uh uh so you know we're unfortunately uh the land i have i can't i it's it's a conservation preserve and so, and it's a scientific organization. So the potential of experimenting with keeping the cattle there or whatever is, is not an option. Um, mm -hmm. the, the good thing is, is that the idea that, uh, and I've seen things, I've seen people say you need to let it rest for three years. That's not the mindset of the, of the land manager of that organization. 
And so we're looking at usually our, our arbitrary turning point in the year to go back onto ground uh, after we've had a grazing event is March 1st. And we're talking about maybe just pushing that to April uh, just to give it another month to build up before we get the animals on. Uh, but then again, he still, he understands that we put the animals on, we're really only impacting the land we're on progressively as we go and the rest of the land is, is resting and recovering in front of us. So, you know, we could graze, uh, we could start in March and be fine. Um, and I'm fine with that. I, I, I found land. Uh, water is the big challenge everywhere I go. Uh, but we're solving those problems. We're going to move the animals out to the coast on uh, Friday. So um, it's been a hard uh, hustle to try to figure out where to put animals right now, particularly because um, everyone's grazed everything down. The conventional world's already feeding hay. Um, and I, I experienced that now for a month, feeding two tons of hay a day to my herd and I don't I don't know why people don't manage their land better because the economics of feeding hay and the the pain in my back uh, tell me it's it's a it's it's a pretty silly business model um, but uh, no I'm 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 definitely uh, um, there's there's fear I wake up at night because it's a it's a big hit to take but uh, it feels like actually uh, this has started some conversations with some landholders that uh, that might be interested in in long term relationships, and it might might create a little expansion for us um, if we can. Uh, I, I require a certain amount of humility in my land partners, <laughs> and, and that's not always easy to find. Um, but but in the wake of this fire. A lot of those people are are changing their context uh, for how they sure. might want animals involved on their land bases. Sure. Well, well, that's fantastic, um, Aaron. Before we open this thing up to questions, I want to bring everybody's attention to a couple of different um, opportunities that they might have if they're interested in helping out the the farmers and ranchers that were affected by fire in this area. Um, one is your you youcaring.com site which um, is on your your screen right now um, and that is a crowdfunding um, site that, that Aaron has um, gotten into to try and help him buy hay and support his his deal going forward specifically um, for his holistic ag business um, the other one that the farmers guild um, put in there is at farmersguild.org and that's a more broad um, charitable organization that the donations going to have will be spread out to producers, farmers, and, and ranchers in the area that were affected by fire to help them recover and rebuild following this, this um, dynamic and disastrous event. Um, again, I want to uh, to thank everybody who is on, and, and I think we should open up the um, dialogue for questions to be asked to um, our speakers. So, Dave, is there any questions coming in? Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is David. I work for the Savory Institute, and I've been kind of working in the background here on just the technical side of things. and. Wanted to go ahead and open it up to a uh, question and answer period. And so if you do have any questions, please feel free to put those in the question box and I will go ahead and unmute you so that you can go ahead and ask those questions. Um, we did have a question from uh, Vale Dixon. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Vale. And if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, you're free to do so. Spencer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Glad to have you. Thanks for having this. Um, so I work with a lot of grazers. Myself, I live in Virginia, so it's not so brittle, but um, we also do have fires. And I'm working with some grazers in Canada that have been affected with fire. And uh, I was wondering, 
you know, about the whole economic situation, because sometimes when you've had this much tragedy to buy that much, it's wondering about feeding the animals. You know, I, I understand we want to get them moving across the land and urinating and defecating and salivating and stirring up all that, any seed that's in the seed bank um, and getting that water and nutrient cycle kind of jump started. But I'm assuming you have to feed them something to keep them performing well. And so I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, I guess I don't want to say assume, but one of the considerations that I want to work with the, the managers are, you know, do they need to destock financially? Can they afford to buy that feed? Is it available? Cause I know the hay in Canada is really expensive and it's not as available. Um, and would they need to maybe bring in a different class of livestock, something more resilient if they had really high performing animals that needed a lot of nutrient or something like that. So what would your recommendations be, um, to help people be able to financially afford to keep the animals on the land if there is really no not much food left for them. Yeah. So Vail, was that directed at me or Alan? Um, I guess both of you. Uh, I just have very little experience in this area, so I was hoping to learn a lot today. Sure. And I know it's individual to each context, so I figured financial context is really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so it, it's tough to hit with a broad stroke um, without knowing a little bit more about the individual rancher's situation. Um, however, um, Alan has shown us through our financial planning and our, our planned grazing trainings and, and whatnot that if you do have to destock, it is um, financially and, and better all around if you do that early. Um, so the yeah. sooner you destock, the more you'll be able to um, bank the available feed for the rest of your livestock, and you'll be you'll be further ahead. Um, if you are in a situation where you have zero vegetation left and you do need to supplement feed um, partially or entirely, there are some pretty interesting ways and um, proactive ways to do that um, that will really jumpstart and ecosystem process and and vegetation growth. Um, the Jerry and Tom Tipton of Nevada, um, I don't know, I think in the 70s and 80s, started reclaiming mine or doing some mine reclamation work on soil that just had no biology in it. Um, and to do that, they, they fed hay um, in a bale graze type situation on those yeah. landscapes. Um, and you know those seed there wasn't a seed bank in those those mine tailings because the the soil or you know had been pulled up from miles down yeah. in the earth um, so they broad, broadcasted yeah. right and so that those are options to where you can feed hay um and not just get through this time period where we are now but you can also import a lot of nutrition back to those sites a lot of fertility um and a lot of seed so um that i i do I feeding. a bunch of resources on different hay feeding patterns and the effects on the land you know i feel like if 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 that's a viable option for them financially it definitely like you said has a big potential to jump start the land even if they did that and then destocked for a bit um to get that initial impact like how how do you manage if you've gotten the animals to move across it in some way, either with hay feeding or even if you don't have hay feeding, but you can feed them in one area, getting them to move across areas and trying to get them at density, as Alan said, how do you, um, it seems like the land to me would need a little bit longer recovery period. Um, so is that where then you would get that initial impact ideally and then destock and then monitor to see the restocking rates? Well, you know, like I say, without having a little bit more information, um, it's tough to tough to really jump into that. But we can manage for recovery periods with stock density, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if we start to manage, you know, our, our livestock in, in such a way that we can impact, add that nutrition, add that fertility back to the site, and then move off of it, then our yep. recovery period starts, right? Because we just stirred up that, broke that crust, you know, after a fire. Um, pretty dramatic soil crust will happen, you know, whether or not there's, you know, if, if you just have a good strong wind, it can break apart those soil particles and, and add to some soil crusting and, and different things. So um, breaking up and that, that soil crust and bringing that fertility and, and 
moisture back to the site, we'll start getting something to germinate and something to happen. From then on, that's when our recovery period, in my opinion, really starts. Um, right. After a dramatic fire, when everything's just totally nuked, and you know, I'm I'm a guy that lives in Nevada, and that's a state that burns every summer. I mean, if if it's not smoky in the air, it's just not summertime. Um, and our <laughs> fires are hot, and they they do totally you know bear the ground and and can have pretty dramatic effects if you're not prepared for them. Um, but with a little bit of management, you can get something to germinate and have something to to move with and for your livestock. Going back to your question as far as how do you destock if you're going to destock, that begs the question a little bit of what classification of cattle do we have and, you know, what stage of, you know, kind of production are they in? Um, you know, if you're in a pretty dramatic fire situation and you don't have the, the nutrition ahead of those cattle, maybe it's time to wean those calves light um, because a cow that's not lactating, she doesn't require nearly as much um, forage. Uh -huh. and nutrition to maintain and improve her her you know body score um, and a cow with an improving condition will breed um, and you can still maintain a pretty healthy business model that way with a short-term knock on your weaning weights and, and selling those calves a little bit early one uh -huh. thing that you do want to be conscious of in those situations is um, adequate protein and energy for those livestock. Right. Um, protein is a limiting factor to total um, forage consumption in ruminants. So if they don't have enough protein, you know, around 8% or more um, of their diet, they simply won't take in enough carbohydrates or energy to, you know, maintain or improve body condition. Mm -hmm. So those are things I'd, I'd want to look at. Um, and knowing that, that would help me decide how would I supplement my livestock. Um, is there enough old vegetation and carbonaceous material there that they could, you know, graze and browse on that to the point um, that all they need is a little bit of protein supplement? I don't which think so. You can do. Also, yeah, they also have the winter with snows just came. So I know that's a whole different factor than in a hotter climate, like if you've caught a fire and then. The drought is broken and some snow comes you know is that in your advantage because it's protecting from some of that it's keeping a little insulation on the land um so that you can have time to get across with the animals and also just wondering like sometimes if you put the stock at really high density and you have a large tract of land it could be a lot to cover even with bale grazing and in, in even one season um mm -hmm. So do you preference trying to just get them where you feed them in certain areas at a medium density and just get them to actually have some impact on the land and it's not super high? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, everything is certainly context or context specific in terms of what is doable. Um, you know, if we're looking at, you know, 10,000 acres and, and big pastures, stock density is a re very relative term. Um, horn rain situations in the Great Basin um, where you don't have enough varied nutrition in small pastures. Um, stock density could, you know, when we're talking about moving cattle at density um, and herding livestock, we still need to be on both north and south facing slopes and giving them access to graze and browse so that they can get enough nutrition to, to maintain. Um, and the questions that you're asking and, and, you know, like I say, without having a little bit more idea in context, the best suggestion and, that I can give you is to go back to the holistic um, testing guidelines and, and the, the original holistic framework that Alan developed um, to help us come to the right answer and yeah. test, you know, all those decisions against. Uh, marginal reaction and gross profit analysis and, and you know, getting the biggest bang for our bucks out of the decisions that we make. Because after a fire, it's hard. Every decision that we make is going to keep us awake at night. Um, and truly the best way to have peace of mind and know to do that you're doing the best thing for your situation is to go back to that testing um, guideline and, and, and use those seven testing questions to uh, to find out what's best for your situation. And then, you know, after you've done that, you truly have made the best decision for, for your, 
situation and context. And then of course, constantly monitor um, all aspects yeah. of it so that you can pivot if you need to. It's such a different environment. So that's where I'd have a little knowledge of what the snow and then the recovery period might be projected to even be, you know, and that's hard for me to make, but um, thank you, Alan. I see you waving your hand. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to say something, but you guys have been going on for a while on that. Uh, this is a typical case, frankly, where I would just do the holistic plan grazing. That's it, period. Just do it. The planning process, it was developed to deal with So that I said earlier, you know, uh, there's a story of a rancher who was burnt out. Let me tell it to you because of the peace of mind it gave him. This particular rancher, I had taught him how to do holistic plan grazing. I was trying to help so many people on five countries that um, I had to start leaving some to look after themselves. I told him to just carry on on his own. I said, you know what to do now. You know how to plan grazing. You just keep doing it. And uh, I need to help other people. And I said, but if you run into any trouble, let me know. Well, about two years later, uh, phone rang. He'd run into trouble. He'd had a terrible fire. It had burnt through most, uh, about half the ranch at least. And he had no grass over uh, thousands of acres. He had water where there was no grass. He had grass where there was no water. Uh, he had a big ranch. He had a lot of cattle and he had to destock or buy feed and destocking was the best alternative for him and he was in a panic and so i agreed to fly out and help him i landed at the airstrip the next morning early he met me at the airstrip and he wanted to take me and show me the cattle and talk about the problems and show me where it was burnt and everything else and i said no you know how to plan i want to see your plan well, no, there's no point in planning. He didn't know how many cattle he could carry. I said, that's exactly why you plan. And we had an argument and uh, it got quite unpleasant. And finally I said to him, look, don't tell me how to do my job. I said, stop <laughs> wasting your money. I said, stop wasting your money and my time. Let me just go. And I walked towards the plane to fly off again. And he uh, came down from his high horse and said, okay, we'll go and do the planning. So we went to the house. His wife was very surprised to see us because it was going to take us a better part of the day to look at all the cattle and the grass and the burnt areas and see what the problem was. And in the house, I never gave him any advice at all. I just said, do the planning. And I sat next to him, got out the planning chart, got the aid memoir out. And I said, just do what it says. And he protested at each step. He said, there's no point in putting his paddocks down. They've got no grass. I said, it didn't ask you that. It only told you, put down the paddocks you've got. And I uh -huh. just was the disciplinarian that made him plan. And an hour later, he had the plan. I said, now, are there any areas you're worried about? There were a couple we sampled. And he didn't have to destock and he didn't have to buy feed. Carried all his cattle through. He probably saved a minimum of $50,000 in an hour's work. And all of the knowledge was in his head. Nobody uh -huh. can plan that. Nobody can see time, supplementary feed, all these things. You can't see it in your mind. Just do the damn planning. That's what it was done, designed for. It's, it's got 300 years experience behind that planning process. Just do it. And I, I'm, then you'll you know, know what to do. Learning this. So um, I appreciate your advice. And then um, I guess I'm trying to understand. So he did rotate them through the paddocks with nothing. He didn't exclude them from the plan or he just rotated them faster through or he allowed them access to the water. Never, walk. You'd never, ever rotate. Remember, it's planned grazing and rotations an absolute no, no. You're moving the cattle on the land. Yeah. So when we went through his plan, when we got to each paddock, put it down, put it to size. And then you, there's a step, I think it was six at that time, you come through and you look at every paddock and say, what are the problems? And then he would say, well, there's no water. And I'd say, okay, but there's, there's water at some time of the year. Let's put water when there is water. And we planned pessimistically. Other paddocks had no grass at all. 
And I said, no, but you want to get the cattle in there as soon as you can. Where can they come from? Where can they go to? Even if uh -huh. they just walk and trample around in it. Yep. And uh, so on. And then packs that had no grass. We had another three months to go till rain. I said, when can we get rain? When could we get grass? Okay, be pessimistic. Plan that you won't have any grass in that for another uh, month after that. So we plan pessimistically. At the end, by the time we'd got all those uh, things onto the chart, we then plotted where to move the cattle. Uh huh. And so when you did that. Well, sometimes you, we do that, and our planning is just moving the animals through areas. Like we started on a farm that didn't have any grass, it was conventional tilled cropland. And, and so we just had to get them, like you're saying, just figure out ways and movement patterns that they're walking through. And it's not always at the density, you know, that you mentioned. So I definitely can see where even animals walking through has a tremendous effect on energizing the land. And um, so I, I have to assess and if you have any forage left and what the snow is going to do, how long, yeah, to help him with these steps. Because he had just joined a program where we kind of meet every two weeks on the phone and go through this. And he was severely overgrazing and overstocked, which we had identified. And he was working on destocking when this fire happened. And so um, he's just now being able to get back on the land. So I'll be working with him to try to assess um, what's what's there yeah. and what he's got. Yeah, well, uh, you know, as Ben said so rightly, without seeing the property and everything, it, you're limited in what you can say. But I've just seen that planning process uh, enable rancher after rancher after rancher to sort out the problems. And I've seen thousands of people fail to do and complain and, and so on. Uh, but I've never seen anybody who uses the planning process run into serious trouble. It really is a very foolproof process of planning. Well, thank you. I actually mailed him some grazing charts already, and hopefully we'll take him through this process. And um, I really appreciate your input. Yeah, that's the best, yeah. you know, and then from there, you'll know where your problems are and what you need to do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Val. That was, that was a great, great question. All right. Yeah. And we haven't had any other questions come in. I wanted to make sure that if anybody did have questions that they could either post them or there is a tool on the left hand side of your control panel where you can raise your hand. And if you would just at this point want to raise your hand, I'll go ahead and turn the mic over to you. So if there's anybody else who'd like to ask a question for Mr. Savory or Mr. Smith, um, please let us know. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I'm sorry about that, Alan. I didn't. I had the webcam deal turned off. I couldn't see a wave and for for to get a hold of everybody. Apologize for that. Okay. Um, I also wanted to re um, bring back this the uh, idea that um, Savory Institute did get a grant from um, a Bay Area granting organization to help uh, establish and train um, and support uh, holistic management in Northern California. So if any of you are on um, the phone and in Northern California and would like to apply for that opportunity, please reach out to me and I can uh, give you the, the directions and the instruction on how to um, get involved with that because we're super excited about the, the generosity and the opportunity to help folks in this new way. So. And it looks like we did have a question come in from Pippa. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Pippa now. Pippa, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, you feel free to do so. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, thanks. So I'm based in Austria. I'm an Australian permaculturist who's interested in how, um, how holistic management can be used for, for disaster response. And I guess there's been a bit of a discussion about how to use the, the holistic management process for grazing land post fire. But I guess um, it would be great if Mr. Savory could explain 
how that management process might be applicable for people in more suburban areas and and denser areas how that connection between the urban and the rural could also take advantage of this beyond people talking about how their beliefs have changed and having a massive paradigm shift but how to apply the the management model in urban spaces post fire okay let me let me try um you know the, the holistic um framework holistic management framework is absolutely universal you can apply it in a family in a home on a ranch at the policy level anywhere think of this way every human for the last thousands of years millions of years has made decisions exactly the same way we were all using a framework that we weren't conscious of. And that's the reductionist framework that we have. So it's, it's used by you every day, even though you're unaware of it, right? Now, we've found the flaws. There, there are a couple of flaws in that framework and why it is so extremely successful uh, for making tools, making anything. It is a tool using animal framework. Every tool using animal uses the same framework. So if you look at the most sophisticated team of scientists or a woman in the household managing a home, or you look at a, an ape or an otter, they make decisions using the same framework. All right, so we've discovered that, understood that, that simple framework and the flaws in it. So it's incredibly successful with everything we make and the computers we're using right now the ability to talk across the world right now space exploration vehicles uh, bombs weapons the big cities we build the roads the bridges everything but nothing we make is complex everything we make is complicated so the, this framework we have in our minds and use is exceedingly successful with everything that humans make right now, if we use the holistic framework, it just corrects a couple of minor flaws in that framework we've always used. And frankly, everything begins to become more successful in what we manage. Because if you think about it today, it is in every area we manage that we're running into trouble. It doesn't matter whether we're looking at the management of fisheries, oceans, forests, um, the stuff that we've been talking of throughout this webinar, whatever we're managing, religions, organizations, we're running into increasing problems globally. As, as I have said earlier, it's like one tsunami after another hitting us. All right, so, so the holistic framework can be used in cities and homes and everywhere. Now, in cities and homes, you would not bring in the extra tool of livestock, but it doesn't matter. You still need to make decisions in your life that take into account the web of complexity, social, cultural, environmental, and economic. So I've had lovely, simple examples with people uh, where it's just a single person working in a town job where they've caught on to how it works and it's helped them improve their lives right away. So it really can be used anywhere. So for, I don't know so for what example, more to say there. So for example, at the beginning point, as people plan to rebuild their houses or to move to a different space, asking them to go through the process um, from context onwards. It's as simple as that again, and providing a space where you could actually support communities in that in that kind of rebuilding and recovery process by asking them to even just start by designing a context for what they want their future life yeah, to be. Well, yeah, anything you're managing, if, if you think about it, you need a context or reason for your management actions. Mm -hmm. That's just common sense, right? And humans always have one. And if you think about it, just think of yourself in your life. And it, almost every action you're taking, you're trying to improve your life. We are mm -hmm. constantly trying to improve our lives. And the actions we take, if you look for the, at the reason or the context for it, it is almost always to meet a need to meet a desire, 
for more profit, more this, more that, or whatever it is, or to address a problem. And if you look at policies of any government, any environmental organization, anybody, even if you look at policies in your home to, to other kids or anything, the only reason you develop a policy is to uh, address a problem, a problem you either have or that you can see is coming, perceived problem. And so, yes, we all will do. Now, that's great for everything we make. But when you're looking at the web of complexity and management, social, environmental, economic, it's not great. It leads to unintended consequences, uh, policies that fail over and over again and lead to unintended consequences. So in the home, in the, in the rebuilding community or anything, if the people just put their arms around what it is they're managing and first uh, decide who, who is making management decisions, who has veto power over them, whatever, who are the people that need to develop the context, and then they develop that idea of a holistic context, that one idea of an overarching context for all your management actions. And then, like Spencer mentioned earlier, once you have that holistic context to guide your management so that you're not neglecting social or cultural or economic any facet of, of the issue, uh, you then have those uh, seven simple questions we've designed um, just to check that your actions are actually in context. And you don't discount anything you do today, like using past experience, research results, friends advice, peer pressure, anything, cash flow, cost effectiveness. You go through all the normal decision making that you, you I'm sure, are using every day. You do that anyway. But when you're close to the final decision, um, you'll know if it's in context or if you're in doubt, you just run it through those checks. And it's actually, it sounds, I always say to people, it sounds complicated, just like if I was on the internet now trying to describe to you how to ride a bicycle, you'd be getting more and more confused and thinking, man, I'll never be able to ride a bicycle. But if I was showing you how to ride a bicycle, you'd, do it, you'd learn in half a day. And it's the same with holistic management. If you can just get somebody to guide you, help you, skilled person, as, as you begin, it's far easier to actually learn by just doing it. And it's, it's actually quicker and easier to make decisions. And one of the really powerful things with any community or, or, or any situation, uh, and one that I like, is that it's, um, it tends to reduce conflict and... and um, bring about more agreement uh, about your actions instead of us arguing and fighting over actions. It's a tremendous uh, way of bringing about agreement and resolving conflict. Because at the moment, our present way of making uh, decisions in our reductionist way, it leads to conflict because people have different ideas or uh, how to solve something uh, and the context is inadequate. So it just leads to conflict. <clears throat> well, good. Well, thank you um, all very much for joining us. I hope this conversation was uh, as good for everybody on the line as it was for, for me. I always enjoy getting to see you, Alan, and, and have a visit like this. I appreciate your insight and your perspective always. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Michael and and Aaron. Also, we appreciate your your help with this discussion. So, um, I think from there thank we'll you, say thank you and good night. Well, thank you, Spence. Thank you, you guys, for including me. You have a good day, and I'm going to have dinner. <laughs> All right. Very good. <laughs> Enjoy your time in Kenya. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, and thank you, Dave, for hosting us. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.